All right, we start a new uh, series uh, today entitled Titus for Beginners. This will be lesson one of this uh, series, the introduction lesson. We'll be covering Titus uh, chapter one, verses one to four. Well, the letter to Titus is the third in a group of letters that include 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, referred to as the pastoral epistles because they were written primarily to teach and guide and encourage two uh, evangelists, Timothy and Titus, who were left in certain places by Paul. Timothy was left in Ephesus and Titus was left in Crete. Uh, they were left there to defend against false teachers, also to set the church uh, in order and to establish and appoint men to the role of elder, thus establishing church leadership. Um, first Timothy and Titus contain many similar ideas and phrases and because of this it is believed that uh, these two epistles, First Timothy and Titus, were written on the same day, somewhere between 62 and 64 AD, when Paul had a brief uh, time of freedom after being released from his first Roman imprisonment and we learned later on that he was rearrested a second time uh, and during that time wrote uh, Second uh, Timothy. Well, while uh, you know, on this uh, brief period of freedom, the apostle used this time to revisit many congregations that he had established in order to encourage them. And it was during this period that he instructed Timothy to remain at the church in Ephesus. We read about that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse three. And, uh, um, uh, uh, gave instructions to Titus to remain at Crete, uh, Crete rather, um, and we'll read about that in the letter to Titus in uh, uh, chapter one, verse uh, five. A little information about the uh, location here. The island of Crete is uh, southeast of Greece, located on the um, imaginary boundary between the Aegean and the Mediterranean seas. Aside from its appearance in the letter to Titus, um, Crete is mentioned two other times in the book of Acts, actually. Um, in, uh, first of all, in Acts uh, chapter two, verse 11. Uh, in that particular um, location, um, Luke writes that people from Crete were among the crowd in Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday, which may explain you know, how uh, Christianity first made its way to that place. Converts on that day uh, may explain the presence of a church on the island some 30 years later. We don't have the details of that, simply that there was one there. And then in Acts 27, Luke mentions that the ship that was transporting Paul to Rome sailed by the island of Crete. Uh, Titus is mentioned several times, however, we don't have much background information on him, as we do uh, Timothy, for example. We know that he was a Gentile convert to Christianity, and he was an early disciple and traveling companion of Paul. And we read about that in Galatians chapter two. Let's read that passage. Uh, Paul writes, then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Bar uh, Barnabas, taking Titus along also, it was because of a revelation that I went up and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And then um, we read about Titus again. He was sent to Corinth to see if problems that had existed there had been resolved according to Paul's teaching in the first letter to the Corinthians. So we read that one in, the, in 2 Corinthians chapter seven. Paul writes, for this reason we have been comforted. And besides our comfort, we rejoiced even much more for the joy of Titus, because his spirit has been refreshed by you all. For if in anything I have boasted to him about you, I was not put to shame but as we spoke all things to you in truth, so also our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. 
So he had told Titus that he had high regard for the Corinthians, that they would uh, respond to his epistle and so on and so forth. And after Titus's visit and confirmation, Paul is writing that he was happy to note uh, that Titus brought back uh, good information about the church. Uh, we know that Paul leaves Titus on the island of Crete to organize the church and to appoint elders there. Let's read that passage. Uh, it says, his affection abounds, uh, let me just finish up 2 Corinthians here, it says, uh, his affection abounds all the more toward you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. I rejoice that in everything I have confidence in you. Yes, that passage right there uh, is where Paul uh, kind of summarizes the um, situation with the Corinthians, how, uh, Tim, uh, how Titus' uh, news about them had confirmed Paul's hope that they would respond. All right, now let's read uh, Titus chapter one, verse five. It says, for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So here, this passage here in uh, Titus uh, tells us uh, why uh, Titus was in Crete, uh, that there was a church there, uh, that they were needing elders, and Paul had left Titus there in order to complete this uh, work. Also in another uh, place, um, uh, Paul mentions that he would meet up with uh, Titus in Nicopolis. It says, when I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Paul also refers to Titus a final time in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, uh, saying that he had traveled to Dalmatia, uh, which is in uh, Croatia, uh, for reasons we do not know. He simply mentions that region and that he was there and he was hoping that uh, he would uh, see uh, Titus. Uh, we know from uh, references in 2 Corinthians that Paul was fond of Titus, but this feeling uh, is less noticeable in his letter to the young preacher. Unlike the fatherly tone that we sometimes hear in 1 and 2 Timothy, uh, Titus is all business. Uh, that letter is all business, all instructions, what you need to do, what you need to be careful for. Uh, in this letter, Paul includes much of the information given to Timothy but he adds sections of practical teaching concerning church life specific to Titus' ministry and still relevant, uh, to, uh, relevant rather, uh, to us today. It's why we study it. We study First and Second Timothy because there's so much information in these two epistles that relate to the work of the minister, the work of elders today in the church. And in the same way, the book of Titus contains a lot of information uh, that helps us today and guides us in our work today as well. Uh, a little bit of background about the letter itself. In his brief letter to Titus, Paul teaches one important lesson, and that is there is a relationship between what we believe and how we act. That's the kind of the theme, the point that he's getting across uh, in this letter. Uh, bad theology or bad philosophy produces a bad society. For example, Nazism you know, uh, had a moment when it, 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 it was doing good for the, for the German people, you know, making the trains run on time and uh, you know, bolstering their economy. But eventually it led to war and war led to ruin. Um, you cannot live right if you are taught wrong. That's uh, you know, to say it more uh, simply. Uh, bad teaching leads to bad actions. So in this letter, Paul is going to charge Titus with the task of preparing leaders who will be able to correctly teach the church, and he gives examples of the teaching and results as a guide in order to measure uh, progress uh, in the church. Now, the reason that Paul takes great care in emphasizing this idea, you know, bad teaching equals bad living, was that in the first century, as in our day, there was a great danger that the purity of the gospel would be polluted by false ideas and thus render it powerless. 
If you change the gospel, if you change it around or take something out of it or add something to it, you dilute it, you, you render it with powerless. It doesn't do the thing that it was designed to do. So the gospel is the power unto God for salvation so long as it is maintained, but it has no power to save if you change it or if you pervert it. This is the reason why maintaining sound doctrine is so critical. You know, today we have so many isms that are trying to dilute or replace the gospel. Humanism, you know, where man is supreme. Uh, existentialism, where you create your own reality. Uh, emotionalism, you know, the idea just follow your heart. That's emotionalism. Not to mention the effects of atheism. Well, there is no God in atheism. And, and spiritual pluralism, the idea that uh, uh, you know, all roads lead to God and all gods are equal. Uh, all those ideas are, you know, are running rampant in our society today. The presence of these uh, influences try to move us towards being a more worldly church or a more ecumenic group. In other words, we accept the ideas and the teachings of everyone in order to maintain some sort of peace and harmony among believers. Uh, and maintaining the pure essence of the gospel is a great challenge in the face of these clamoring voices disguised many times as catalysts for change, when in reality they are unsuspecting agents of unsound and improper teaching. Uh, change is, there's nothing wrong with change. Change is good. You know, we want to change things to do things better or more effectively or to, or to keep up with the times or the, the needs of the times change. There's nothing wrong with change. But we mustn't change the, the gospel. If we change the gospel, well then we've, we've actually lost the war because we've taken away the one thing that has power to change an individual and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, in the day of Titus, the presence or this pressure came uh, from a particular group of teachers and teachings um, referred to as Gnosticism. <clears throat> that was the challenge of the day. Um, that we don't necessarily face uh, today, but that was prevalent in the time when uh, Titus was a, a minister. Talk a little bit about uh, Gnosticism here. Gnosticism is really a, a modern name for a system of teaching that was prevalent in the first and second century, and then it died out uh, shortly after. It didn't have a body of teaching, but very much like, remember the New Age movement of the 90s? Gnosticism had many strands of teaching and ideas that were woven into a loose system of doctrine. Now, the strands of, that conflicted with Christianity and that Titus had to deal with was a combination of uh, Jewish and Greek Gnosticism that had been intertwined and was being offered and taught uh, to the church by uh, various individuals. Basically, it revolved around the false teaching regarding the origins of the earth. Doesn't that sound familiar? False teaching about where the earth comes from? Well, this was going on back in the first century. Basically, it revolved around false teaching regarding the origins of the earth uh, in this way. The Greeks had developed a teaching which proposed that the earth was created by the descendants of the gods, and the god of darkness was the one who had created the earth. They also taught that man's spirit was good because it had been created by the good god, the god of light and uh, man's spirit desired to return to its source, uh, the, the good God. But the material world, which was essentially evil, prevented this from taking place. Uh, this was the classic soul versus flesh conflict, if you wish, that Plato talked about in his, uh, uh, not doctrine, but in his philosophy of dualism. 
contain the same idea, you know, this battle between two entities. Well, from these, two main, from these teachings, if you wish, two main ideologies were developed to solve this problem of the soul versus the flesh. The material versus the spirit, if you wish. The first of these was asceticism. You know, how do you resolve this battle between the good and evil? How do you resolve this battle between the material and the spiritual? The soul of man trying to escape the evil material world to return to its pure source. Well, one way uh, was through asceticism. In other words, the complete renunciation of the flesh in order to liberate the soul. Okay? Uh, Saturnius uh, taught that one ought not to marry, for example, because it just created more material, in other words, children, right? Uh, which was bad, all right? Paul refers to this in Colossians chapter two, verses eight to 23, or 1 Timothy chapter four, verses one to four. Many religions, Hinduism and Buddhism and medieval Roman Catholicism adopted many of these uh, ideas. And then there was the other method of resolving this problem, antinomianism, um, antinomianism, there we go, that's a better saying of it, meaning no law, okay, the absence of law, this idea taught that once the soul was released from the body through enlightenment, it no longer uh, was morally responsible for what the flesh did. In other words, what you did in the flesh did not affect the spirit. Once the, once the, the, the spirit was freed from the, 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 the flesh through enlightenment, well, it didn't matter what the flesh did after that. So many cults, disguise and justify their immoral behavior on the basis of a higher reasoning, a higher enlightenment, if you wish. So to this, to this type of thinking, right, to this type of dualistic thinking, the Jewish Gnostics added their particular brand of mysticism and genealogy and their penchant for debate and nitpicking, which gave the Greek ideas a certain Jewish flavor debating genealogies, debating various ideas. You know, this, was, this was the specialty of the Jews, right? The Pharisees, absolutely. You know, what one rabbi taught versus what another rabbi taught and they would debate these things. So to the Greek idea of Gnosticism, you know, this dualism, this battle between the good and the evil, the soul and the spirit, the Jewish Gnostics added their uh, flavor, if you wish of genealogies and, and, and superstitions and, uh, uh, and of course um, uh, uh, Jewish uh, laws uh, concerning uh, uh, food restrictions and so on and so forth. And so the result was a church that either um, searched for salvation through a works-oriented system driven by the Greek idea of dualism, you know, salvation through self-denial, or a church so unconcerned with sin and moral responsibility that it was in danger of losing its soul through immoral behavior, like the people in Corinth, for example. So either way, the false teaching undermined the gospel and it had to be dealt with by those who knew the truth and had the capacity and the courage to teach it. This then is what Paul is setting Titus up to do in Crete with his letter. And so we have the outline of this letter. There's the salutation, which is Paul's mission, chapter one, verses one to four, and that is to preserve and pass on sound doctrine. So that's the salutation and the opening encouragement, if you wish. The body of the letter is uh, about Titus's mission, chapter one, verse five, to chapter three, verse 11, broken down into two sections. The first, uh, the information or the instruction that Titus has to appoint sound elders, chapter one, verse five to 16, and then provide sound teaching or sound doctrine, chapters two, verse one, to chapter three, verse 11, and then the conclusion of the letter, a few short verses, chapter three, verses 12 to 15, personal greetings, 
and final instructions. So the letter to Titus is a very compact three chapters, but it contains the core teaching of the Christian faith concerning the gospel. All right, now there's no you know, casual greeting here. Uh, you know, hello, how are you, how are things? This is a statement, the opening statement if you wish. This is a statement and a declaration of identity and purpose and proclamation in the first three verses. So we read, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior. And so these verses Paul does the following. Number one, he describes his relationship to God. His relationship to God is he is a bond servant. He's not a hired hand, but one that is completely submitted to his master, thus the term bond servant. And so that's his relationship to God. Secondly, he describes his relationship to Christ as an apostle. In other words, he's an envoy or he's a special messenger. One word, slave, describes who he is and the other word, apostle, describes what he, as a slave, has been given to do for God and that is be a messenger for Jesus Christ. Third thing, he describes his ministry. He describes the message that he as an apostle has been given to proclaim and the ministry that this task has produced. And so he begins by explaining the ministry itself. The faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth according to godliness are the same thing. And what is that thing? Well, it's the gospel message itself, okay? Christians become the chosen of God when they believe the gospel. The truth according to godliness, which is proclaimed and lived out in a godly way, is the gospel, okay? So he's, he's mentioning the gospel in various ways. He's giving it different terms, but it's always the gospel that he's talking about. He says, it is through this gospel, which was promised through the patriarchs and the prophets, that eternal life is offered and obtained. So nothing new here in the sense that there is a continuity. The prophets were also chosen by God and the servants in the Old Testament were also serve, uh, chosen by God and the patriarchs were chosen by God and all of them were there to bring uh, to, uh, uh, into being the arrival of Jesus Christ, who would you know, live and who would teach and who would die on the cross and resurrect and offer salvation uh, to all men because of this. The news of this, the story of this, called the gospel, is something that had been prepared and transferred and finally given to people like Paul, apostles, in order to uh, proclaim uh, uh, to the world. My task, Paul explains in verse three, now that the proper time has come, well, what is the proper time? Well, Jesus has appeared, he's died, he's resurrected, he's ascended to heaven as the prophets said he would. So my task is to proclaim this good news. I do this as a slave of God, according to his command, and as a servant of Christ, that I am proclaiming the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is my task. This is my sacred ministry. For Paul, this task is not just a job or obeying an order, but as I said, it is a sacred trust. God himself has entrusted Paul with this mission. And what is the mission? To proclaim the gospel and to teach God's word. So in these opening verses, Paul has not only described his unique mission, but also his credentials. He was sent by God, he was chosen by Christ. This he has done to establish his spiritual authority that he will exercise when teaching later on in this letter. 
We read verse four, he says, to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. So Paul now addresses Titus with both affection and respect. He refers to Titus as his true child, the same expression he uses with Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2 calls him a true child. He says that he and Titus have a common faith, meaning that he knows that Titus holds the same doctrine and the same teaching as well as the same expectation, which is eternal life as he, Paul, does. So he and Titus are on the same wavelength. They believe the same thing, they teach the same thing, and they're expecting the same thing, which is eternal life. Now, this point may not be necessary for Titus, because he already knows this, but it is a definite signal to the church, especially the Gnostic teachers and sympathizers that are in the church, that as far as doctrine is concerned, the Apostle Paul and his disciple Titus are teaching the same thing. Just in case you thought you could undermine Titus, just in case you thought maybe that he was teaching something different than I am, or that he is teaching with, with less authority than I have, well then you know, let me remind you that he and I are teaching the very same thing. Okay. So this speaks to Titus' credibility before the church and of course before other teachers. So the apostle completes his greeting in a similar way that he did in his first letter to Timothy. He says, grace, all the blessings of God summarized in one word, grace. Peace, the peace that surpasses understanding that the one who is blessed experiences. If you have the grace of God, if that's what you have, then the way you experience that is that you have peace that surpasses understanding. The grace is what produces the peace. The source of the grace is God the Father Himself. And the connection to the grace, how we enter into that grace, is through uh, Jesus Christ. So Paul writes a brief letter to a young preacher, Titus, who was working with a young congregation or a couple of uh, congregations in that area. We know this because they had no elders, whereas the church at Ephesus where Timothy served already had elders. We read about them in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Titus faced problems with Gnostic teachers as did Timothy, but he did so without the help of elders, which he had to establish in more than one congregation. So Titus had a unique problem. He had a particular issue facing uh, him that was quite daunting, as a matter of fact. So Paul helps establish his credibility as a teacher and a leader, and he also provides him with a blueprint outlining the core principles of the Christian faith that he, as well as any of the leaders that he might appoint, needed to learn and teach and then pass on to the next generation. So this is what the letter to Titus is about. This, these are the problems that Titus faced, and this is how Paul uh, begins to address these issues by establishing Titus' uh, credibility as a person uh, and the credibility of his teaching because Titus is teaching the same thing that Paul is teaching and uh, hoping for the same things as a result uh, of the teachings that he believes and that is uh, eternal life. Okay, well we'll stop there. We've done the introduction and we'll go into the kind of the meat of the matter uh, in our next lesson. Thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time.